Amen. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for giving us a bilingual welcome. That was awesome. That's so cool to see and it's so inspiring. And thank you, especially for the prayer. Um, I think, you know, it's it's funny. I, I always notice when the Holy Spirit is putting things on people's hearts. You talked about the challenges that a lot of people are going through. And that's kind of what a, I want to talk a little bit about tonight. You know, I've been praying and what I, what I do whenever I know I'm going to be teaching, um, you know, I start praying a couple of days in advance of like, what God, what do you want me to talk about? What do you want me to focus on? What is it? What's the message that you want to share with the church? So um, I have something that God has definitely put on my heart to talk about. Let me go ahead and put up my slides here. And um, the, the, I just titled it Ready for the Times. Um, you know, there's there's so much happening in our world. There's so much happening all around us and our lives. And here we are in the holiday season. We are in it now, right? We we got through Halloween. We got through Thanksgiving. And and what a great time. We Michelle and I had so much fun having, uh, we had a Friendsgiving and a whole bunch of uh, uh, brothers and sisters were, were able to show up for that. That was a blast. And and um, then we in a couple of weeks, we've got the the family group leaders and staff party and can't wait for that and the elders. And um, it's just it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of family. It's a lot of connection. But also, we all know it's a time that Satan oftentimes go on, goes on the attack. It can also be an emotionally hard time. It can also be a spiritually hard time. And um, and this is what God put on my heart, you know, being ready for the times that we're in, being ready for for all the things that we're going to be facing, that we are facing, that we've been facing. Um, in Ephesians 5, he says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And I think I, I spoke on the scripture a, a few weeks ago. I, I can't remember, um, but but this scripture has been on my heart a lot because just so much going on in the world, so much going on in life, and 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 I feel like I keep bumping into situations where people are going through a lot, or there's a lot of tension, or there's a lot of challenge, or and even I mean, I just it seems like all over the world there's all kinds of anger. Um, it just, I kind of wonder, honestly, I, I wonder, like, is this the time that Satan, like, goes on a campaign? Because here, in one sense, on the outside, at least, the whole world is focusing on Christmas, which is a celebration of the birth of Jesus. And it's a time that a lot of people do focus on Jesus. A lot of people go to church that never go to church. But yet, it seems like sometimes, and oftentimes, I would say, that Satan also goes on a campaign during this time. And and I think, you know, that 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 phrase right there, because the days are evil, and it's really felt like that a lot, man. I've, I've been in so many situations where where people were going through uh, difficult times or challenging times or or hurtful times or angry times or or desperate times. I mean, just a lot going on. And and this is just the last couple of weeks. So I think I think this is this is a, a time to stop and think about the times and think about God, you know, in Revelation 2.10, it mentions just a little mention about Satan. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. And this is a letter to, I, I can't remember which church it is. Um, it's not Ephesus. I think it's, uh, oh, I can't remember, Smyrna. I think it's Smyrna. And he says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. And it's just a little comment to the church in Smyrna. But like when you think about it, I mean, this is what the Apostle John heard in a revelation that he shared with the church. He said, look, the devil or Satan's going to test you and you're going to be arrested. You're going to go through suffering. You're going to be persecuted. And even has the exact amount of time since for 10 days. You know, and and he says, but be faithful, even to the point of death. You know, and and I think if there's any time that somebody would feel like I have the right to lose my faith, it would be at the point of death. But he says, be faithful. Don't lose your faith. Don't give up on your faith. Don't back off on your faith. 
even to the point of death. He says, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. But it shows a couple of things. It shows, one, that Satan does have campaigns. He has times that he attacks Christians specifically to try to get them to lose their faith. And it shows us that that this is a very real thing. This isn't just some theory or some philosophy or something. This is real. Satan really does attack Christians, and he really does go after them. Um, of course, I think of Ephesians 6, 12, where it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And, and I mean, here's Paul, you know, preparing us as Christians, helping us to be ready for this stuff because it happens. And I think sometimes, especially in the United States, because we live in a very secular country in, in the, well, in one sense, we're religious, but in another sense, we don't really believe in, you know, on a practical level, we don't believe in demons or devils or, or evil spirits and stuff. And we don't necessarily think of this, but I think us as Christians, we know it's real. And we've all bumped into this. We've all had to deal with this, and and we know that that you know that there are spiritual forces out there, and that the world is dark. And I think the more spiritual you get, the more you, you become aware of this. The more you know that there are spiritual forces. And I appreciate that. This is our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. And sometimes we get confused and we think it's people that are messing us up or people that are in the way or people that are, you know, the problem. And, and yeah, we're the problem sometimes. And yeah, we definitely mess up. And yeah, we hurt each other sometimes. And yeah, we, we have struggles with each other. But that's not the real enemy. The real enemy is the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And I think in this time of year, we we I think we got to really be alert. I think we've got to be awake. We've got to be aware of what Satan tries to do to us and how he tries to go after us. In Colossians 2.8, Paul said, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. I mean, there's two things, you know, he tells us that you've got to make sure, you've got to see to it. Anytime the Bible says, see to it, that's like, make sure, pay attention, watch out for this. He says, make sure that no one takes you captive through hollow or deceptive philosophy. And, you know, there's so much philosophy bouncing around the world right now. There's so many ideas and ideologies and, and philosophies trying to influence us. And it's important that we understand and we let Jesus influence us and God guide us through and not let the world teach us how to think or how to feel or how to be about things. And, and he says these things depend on human tradition, not godly, not scripture, not the Holy Spirit. They, 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 these things that can influence us, that can, and they can, he says, it can take us captive. Even a Christian can be taken captive by deceptive philosophies or human uh, thinking or humanistic thinking, human tradition. Be aware that there are elemental spiritual forces of this world, and we've got to set our minds on Jesus, on thinking like Jesus, being like Jesus, seeing things the way Jesus wants us to see, to see them, and having what we would commonly call a spiritual mindset, right? Um, John and, and Johnny records Jesus saying, I have come more, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own accord. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. I mean, the, one of the, the great promises of Jesus is that basically the Holy Spirit is going to help us. He's the spirit of truth. And I think, man, the, I'll tell you, the older I get, I've been doing this. 40 years, the longer I've been a disciple, the more I value the spirit of truth, the more I value this gift, because things get really confusing, and things get really messed up, and Satan is always trying to mess up our thinking, but Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, will guide us along. He'll show us. Um, he'll show us along, and of course, that's why we have 
the Bible, right? That's why we have the scriptures, as it says, Second Peter, that the prophets, through, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So thinking spiritually, thinking scripturally, looking at the world, what does the Bible say about this? What did Jesus say about this? Um, how should I think about this? I think this is incredibly important, especially when we're in dark days. And I know not everybody's in dark days, but a lot of us, I think, and I keep hearing about different things, a lot of us are going through challenges. A lot of us are feeling a lot of stuff, and and it's it's just been intense. I mean, for me, just the last two weeks have been really intense. A lot of tough talks, a lot of tough situations. My, my aunt just passed away. Um, Michelle's... Um, brother fell and and hurt his neck really bad and had to go to the hospital and and Michelle her parents that were just with us went home and the next day their neighbor their best friends died suddenly from a heart I mean we're just bam 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 all these intense things happening around us and I'm feeling it I'm aware of this you know and I think we always have to be aware you know that of the evil one what the Bible calls the evil one you know in Jesus's prayer the prayer the the, the 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 Lord's Prayer, it ends with, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I mean, there is an evil one. And I know that some people teach there is no devil, and some people teach that the devil is just a Greek uh, mythological construct that we twist scripture. That's it's not what the scripture teaches. I mean, yes, we generally get our image of the devil from Greek mythology, but but there is an evil one. Uh, in Matthew 13, 19, he says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart. I mean, the evil one does not want you to listen to scripture, does not want you to be impacted by scripture, does not want you to be transformed by scripture. And, and that was the parable of the sower, right? That watch out. So pray that you were, were delivered from the evil one. That's that's actually, there's a whole thing called deliverance ministry. And it's helping people to escape Satan, to escape demons, to escape what is evil. And I don't pretend to know it all of like, how does that work? Demons and devil and Satan. I, I don't, I've never done a, a total in-depth study, but I know it's real. I've run into it. I've dealt with it. And there is definitely seasons where Satan seems to be like go on a, like a campaign, like a launch. He goes after. I think we're in one, and and that oftentimes happens around Christmas time. Um, in Matthew thirteen thirty eight, he says, "The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. Like the evil one, there he is again, and he's actually puts people in there." To mess us up, you know, and, and I don't even think that people mostly know when they're being used by Satan, when they're doing Satan's work, when they're promoting anger or bitterness or hatred or or whatever, you know, just sin. And they don't even necessarily realize it, but they are the people of the evil one and they don't even know it. Most most of the time, I don't think people realize it. And of course, in John 17, it says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Like this is this is so intense that Jesus was praying that we would be protected from the evil one, that you and I would have protection from the evil one. So we know the evil one, right? We call him the devil, we call him Satan, we call him Lucifer, we call him the the the, the Muslims call him Al Shaitan, Al Shaitan, uh, the Jews call him Beelzebub, Beelzebul. And, and they has different names in the, in the scriptures called sometimes the adversary, the tempter, the accuser, the deceiver, the Leviathan, the ruler of the air. And, and even Jesus said, that, you know, pray for God's will to be done because he told us that the ruler of this world is the ruler of the air. It's not God. It's not Jesus. I, a lot of times I, I, it, it, it kind of concerns me when I'll hear Christians say, well, you know, God is in control. God is in control, but that does not mean that God controls everything. Because he gives us freedom of choice, that means a lot of stuff happens that is not his will. And, and he doesn't control us. If he controls, we'd be robots. We wouldn't be in his image. We would be like, like you know, 
we would be like robots and we wouldn't have free will. And in order to be able to love, you've got to have free will and you've got to be able to choose. So what happens? Well, people choose evil and, and it opens the door for evil to come. And the ruler of the air is ruling this world. That's why we got to pray. That's why we. That's why that prayer says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have to pray for that. We have to ask for that because that's not what's happening. It's more the devil's will is being done. And 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 most of the time people don't know it, right? Most of the time people aren't even aware. And, and, and Paul tells the Corinthian church, and no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. You know, that even evil, the best, the best trick evil does is it doesn't look evil. It looks good, it looks right. And it fools people into thinking that I'm safe here. I'm good. His name, devil, is actually Diabolos, which literally means two-tongued, the liar, basically, the father of lies, right? Jesus called him the father of lies. And, and of course, the common lies are evil is good, good is evil. If it feels right, just do it. Have it, your, have it and live it your way that you deserve to do things your way. Your will is what's important. What you want is what matters most. I mean, these are the lies of Satan. You have the right to do and believe whatever you want. And, and you can do anything you feel like. I mean, all these kind of have a feeling of, yeah, that feels good. That, that does seem right. You know, I, I can do whatever I want. Da, da, da. And yet that is not what God says. That is not what Jesus teaches, right? Um, the two tongues, man is good without God. That's that's one of the big lies is that man is good without God. And, and that's just not true. Without God, we we do horrible things. I mean, look at our history, how we abuse and enslave and we're racist and we're and we and we don't care about the poor. We all these junk that happens. But with God in our life, we care. We learn to love. We learn to forgive. We learn to, to be kind. We learn to take action to help one another. I mean, it, it and that all comes from God. That's that's him in us. That's us living out our the image of God in us. Um, he's he's two-tongued. He tries to get us to believe that there is no God, and a lot of people believe that. That Jesus was fake, lots of people believe that. That death is the end of things. Tons of people believe that, even though there's so much there's so much evidence that that's obvious that death is not the end. But a lot of people believe that evil is more powerful. A lot of people believe that that it's better to do evil because you'll get more, or you'll be better, or you'll have more. Um, and and then there's other lies that are damaging, like that you are worthless, that you don't matter, that no one loves you. These are ones that really hurt deep. And Satan is always trying to convince us of. And unfortunately, some of us, we grew up in homes where this was actually said. And so we have that tape in our minds, or somebody told us this, or or something happened in our lives, and we wonder if this is true. And it's just a huge lie from Satan, or even one of the worst, that Jesus does not love you. I, I remember there was an ad in a paper years ago that was, was the Atheist Society right here in in, in LA, and they were putting on a conference. And the title was, um, uh, uh, the title was "God Does Not Love You and Jesus Doesn't Care," or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. Something like "Jesus Doesn't Love You," and it was just so like in your face evil. And that's 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 Satan's work. I you know I ran into this scripture once. I was doing a study a while ago, and I thought it was so interesting. It's in Ezekiel, and it's a controversial scripture. You know, who's he talking about? Is he talking about the king of Tyre? Because he says in there, he talks about the king of Tyre. But clearly the things he says about him are more than the king of Tyre. It's definitely, and, and, and many scholars will say, no, he's absolutely talking about Satan. But like many times in the Bible, it has a double meaning. It'll talk about a situation at that time in that place, but it also saying things that apply to everything else. Like a lot of the messianic scriptures that talk about Jesus coming are like that. They're talking about something specific, but they're also talking about what's to come and who and the Messiah. But the same thing works the other way with Satan. Listen to this in Ezekiel 28. He says, He says, You were the seal of perfection 
full of wisdom and perfect beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, jasper. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created. They were prepared. You were the anointed angel, or cherub, it says, but angel, who covers. And I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. This is, he's talking about an angel that was so beautiful. That was, it says, you are the seal of perfection. That was such a, such a, like a, an accomplishment of full wisdom and perfect beauty, he says, in the Garden of Eden. So we know he's not talking about the King of Tyre. And, and in the Garden of Eden of God, precious stones adorned you. I mean, this is an, he's talking about an angel. And we, and we read more and he says, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. You were you were you were on a great path until you turned away from it. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub or angel, from the midst of the stones of fire. So it's I mean it's if it's not Satan, it's definitely an angel, a demon. But it's probably, I think it is Satan, that he's describing the fall of this beautiful angel. Um, in Isaiah, he says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high, which, you know, I mean, this is like the arrogance and the pride of Satan, right? Which he always wants to influence influence us to think the same way, that I'm great. I'm going to do great things. I don't need God. I can make myself great. And Isaiah exposes it, you know, this, this evil thinking. And then, of course, we have Revelation that kind of wraps it all up. He says, he, he talks about the whole big picture of creation. He says, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And, you know, it it, it kind of, well, it's the big picture, right, of how Satan, the devil, was cast from heaven along with his angels. Where were they sent? To earth. I mean, to earth. And, again, I don't claim to know exactly how all this works, but I do know there's evil. And I do know that there's some pretty scary stuff happening out there, and there's a lot of scary stuff happening in our world. For everything from the, from the wars to depression to 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 suicide, all this junk. There is no doubt in my mind. This is the influence of Satan, the influence of the devil, and he would like to separate all of us from God, all of us from each other, all of us into his teaching. And yet Jesus said, "The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning." So he's absolutely influencing lots of us, lots of people. But he says, the reason the Son of God appeared, I and mean, this is pretty major. Why did Jesus come? Was to destroy the devil's work. It's what Jesus said. I'm here to destroy what he's doing. I'm here. I mean, think about it. what does that mean? What does that mean that he's destroying devil? What's the devil doing? He's trying to separate us from God. He's trying to turn us against each other. He's trying to fill us with hatred and anger and, and, and make this world a godless place. Jesus came to destroy that work, to turn that around. In James 4, 7, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, and 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 th there are so many things that, that Satan is going to try to do to influence us and to lure us in, 
and we've got to resist them. And, and this is the cool promise. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Not the resist the devil and he will overpower and beat you. No, he will flee from you. Why? Because you're Christians. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the name of Jesus, which is the name above all names, right? Peter wrote, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So what does be alert mean? Pay attention. Watch out. Think about it. What, what is Satan doing to lure me in? How is he trying to get me, to discourage me, to make me mad, to, to steal my faith, to, to make me hateful? I mean, you know, what is he up to? Jesus told Simon Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. I mean, there's a, there's a pretty scary statement here. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Satan actually goes after individuals. And there are times that I know he's coming after me. And I'll bet there are times that you know he's coming after you. And there's times that we don't realize he's coming after us until we've already fallen into sin. And, and there's sometimes we even fall into sin and we still don't realize that we got lured into that by Satan, that we got reeled in like a fish on a hook because we weren't paying attention. That's why we have to be alert. And what did Jesus say? He says, I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. That's our protection, right? Our faith. What is faith? It's trusting God. It's don't. What's the opposite of faith? Unbelief? No. In a, in a non-Christian, unbelief is the opposite of faith. But in a Christian, fear is the opposite of faith. We get fearful. We get afraid. Uh, things aren't going to go right. We get afraid. I'm going to get hurt. We get afraid. Uh, you know, I'm not going to have money. Or we get afraid somebody's going to look down on us or somebody's going to attack us. Or we just get fearful. And, and he says, I, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, which tells you a lot of how Satan would come after us, how he would come after Peter. What are you afraid of? And that's what he's going to go after, to stir up, not your faith, to stir up your fear. What are you afraid of? That's what he's going to feed. That's why the most common command in the Bible is do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I fear no evil, for you are with me, right? And he says, and when you turn back, when you when you got back to a good place, strengthen your brothers. Because you know why? Because they're going through it too. They're going through challenges. Um, Paul says to the church in Rome, he says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, okay? If for him to say neither angels or demons means they're here, means they're real. Neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have to be confident in that. We have to be solid in that because Satan doesn't have power over us. And, and, and neither angels nor demons. I mean, angels are the good guys, right? But demons are not. And they're trying to separate us. But they cannot. They have no power over us. And, and we'll close out with this. You know, in Ephesians 6, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Not your mighty power. Not the power of the church. Not the power of your Bible talk. Not the power of your family. His mighty power. Not the power of our character or our discipline. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. What did we start out talking about? The devil scheming. He is scheming. I think he's scheming big time right now. I think he's really trying to rob people of their joy, rob people of their zeal, of their faith. Not everybody. And if you're one of the ones that, man, everything's going great. Amen. Celebrate. Enjoy it. But I, I just, I see it. I see it happening with a lot of people right now. And whether it's, whether it's, temptation to drink or do drugs or it's anger or it's 
it's you know mistrust or what's going to happen to me or my economic situation or the world the war the the I mean there's just so much out there I mean just take your back the long list and he says therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes when is the day of evil today you may be able to stand your ground you don't get knocked down you don't get beat up you you might take some hits. You might you might get knocked around, but you're standing. And he says, and after you've done everything, you're able to stand. You could stay standing. But what do you got to do? You got to put on the full, full armor of God. He says, with the belt of truth, right? That we keep. What is the truth? Don't let my don't let Satan trick me into believing something that's not true. With with the breastplate of righteousness, I'm gonna do what's right, no matter what. I'm going to believe what's right. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to stay in the right lane. I'm going to stay on the path with what your feet fitted with readiness. What does that mean? Whatever God wants, if he call, if he's calling me to serve, to love, to give, to, to focus, set my mind on things of above, to fix my eyes on Jesus, I'm ready. I'm doing it. I'm there. That's, that's the heart of humility that comes from the gospel of peace that I can... Trust God. He, God's got my best interests. He's He's out to give me peace in this troubled world. In addition, all this, take up the shield of what? Faith. Everything always comes back to faith. Faith, love, and truth. Those are the big three. Faith, love, and truth. And he says, and, and that protects you, right, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows. Satan is throwing all, is shooting flaming arrows at us. It's bad enough as an arrow to get hit by an arrow, but to get hit by a flaming arrow, that's even worse from where of the evil one who we're talking about tonight. The flaming arrows. Do you notice when, when you get shot by a flaming arrow? Do you feel it? Do you sense it? Are you aware? Do you know you've been shot by a flaming arrow? What are the flaming arrows this week? What are the flaming arrows this month? Take the helmet of salvation that you've been saved, your guarantee of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God, scripture, staying in there, reading every day, reading, read a chapter every morning, read, make sure you're getting good time in scripture. That's what protects us from the evil one. So I want to close out with some questions I think these would be good just to, to to wrestle through, to think through. And if you're in your groups, you know, talk about this in your groups. How does Satan come after me? Think about it. Identify it. What does he do to come after me? What are the best tools that he has to discourage me? Like, what are his tools? What does he use to come after my heart to discourage, to take my courage away? What fears do I have that he uses against me? Like, what are the what are my fears? And and all of us, especially as as disciples, we should be aware. What am I afraid of? What what are my fears right now? How and because you know Satan's going to use that against you. But if you don't know what your fears are, you don't even know what he's using against you. Know your fears. And you know, whenever when I find I feel bothered by something or I feel really disturbed, or I'm struggling, or emotionally upset, or I'm just off, you know, that's one of the questions I ask myself. What, what am I afraid of? Why, is, why am I so disturbed? What, what's the fear in here? It's a really important question. What are the temptations he will use to try to hook me? I mean, most of us have been Christians a long time. By now, we should know which of the hooks that dig into my, to my heart. How does Satan hook me? What are the temptations that he's going to throw at me? Because they're not the same for everybody, right? Some people, oh, I'm not tempted with that at all. Other people are, whoa, that's a hard one to overcome. That's a hard one. When or where am I most susceptible? Is it when I'm staying up late at night? Is it when I'm by myself? Is it, well, you know, when and where? That's important to know because you don't, you got to avoid those situations, Right. You got to stay away from when and where you're most susceptible to Satan's influence, to the evil one. How might he separate me from God's love? Like what, or from God, or from God's love, right? How, what are the tricks? Like if, if, if you played the devil's advocate for a minute and we're going after you, what would you do to separate you from God? 
What would you throw? Is it busyness? Is it financial problems? Is it worry? Is it sickness? Is it whatever, you know, whatever it is? I mean, what are those things that that he will use? How might he separate me from the church? You know, I mean, the church is a big target right now. And, you know, there's all kinds of things happening. And you know Satan's going to try to do that because obviously you separate from the herd and you're the most easy target, right? That's that's a that's a no-brainer. What might he try to hurt my faith? Like what would rob me of my faith? What would make me not trust God? What would make me not trust the scriptures? How might he distract me? You know, if he can get me not to turn to evil, but just to turn away from good and focus on other things. He can destroy me. He he can wipe me out. So, you know, as we go into the, you know, as we're we're not going into, we're in the holidays. But even this month, we you know, Christmas is right around the corner. December, boy, you know, every, we all know, all of us who've been around, we know this is a big time for Satan. This is the time he goes after us. And I, I'm telling you, I feel it. I see it and I feel it. It's out there. And, and. Wow, we have got to stay close to God. We have not, we've got to be alert. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around. Be alert, be aware. Um, we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be uh sending out a, a 25 days of celebrating Jesus in the month of December. I really want to encourage you to do it. Hopefully, you got to do the Thanksgiving one. Um, I'm working on one right now for, for Christmas of just celebrating Jesus and keeping our eyes focused on him and, and watch out. We should have that hopefully by the end of next week and, and just to help us in this time, right? Because the truth is the days are evil and we want to have a great Christmas, great celebrations together, great times with our families to be just a, a, a truly a celebration of Jesus, right? That's what Christmas is supposed to be. So that's the plan. And with that, I will stop sharing and I'll hand it back over to you, Reese.